everyone so today we're going to be doing a reaction to the uh, Wellington Strikes Battle of Salamanca 1812 so the reason why I'm doing this reaction even though my channel is not going to be dedicated to reactions is that uh, today marks the 210th anniversary of this very battle the Battle of Salamanca uh, in Spain is known as the Battle of the Batalla de los Arapiles, because that's actually where it took place in the t the small town of Arapiles, which is south of the city of Salamanca. Um, and I'm very excited to to react uh, to this video. Uh, let me close that real quick. So I'm really ex uh, I'm really excited to react to this video in particular uh, because. I actually visited the city of Salamanca back in January. It was part of a, of a two week trip that I took with my best friend who actually lives over there. And we were traveling in different cities around the, the country. And our last stop was in Salamanca. And it was really, really fascinating to me because the only thing I could think about was the battle that took place nearby. And I was super, super excited. I got, uh, I couldn't visit the battlefield itself. We just, uh, we didn't have enough time for, for that. Um, but when we were on top of the cathedral of the city, we could see the battlefield from up there, and for, and it was really, really exciting. So I'm really uh, gonna talk about this. But I'm not going to be dedicating myself to just talking about the battle alone. I'm, I'm using this as a platform as a starting point, because I want to talk about the impact in the Caribbean on the Peninsular War, which is the whole context of, the, of this battle. The Peninsular War, also known as the War of Independence, um, was a war that lasted from 1808 to 1814 as part of the, of the larger Napoleonic Wars. This is when, uh, when Napoleon Bonaparte... Uh, decided uh, to invade the kingdom of Spain because he considered that the Spain was weak he was backwards uh, the ki their kings uh, the king at the time was King Carlos the uh, fourth was uh, he was uh, considered weak um, and also because uh, his chief minister Manuel Godoy who's been chief minister for a very long time at this point, was also uh he was very corrupt and among other things so the uh, napoleon uh, ordered his armies to invade the, uh, the country and, and occupy it and this is going to have a big impact not just in the caribbean but in america as a whole because basically this war is what's gonna cause it's basically what sparks the wars of independence in Latin America, and and I'm using, I'm gonna be Latin America is gonna, it's even uh, the 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 real term that should be used will be Hispanic America because it, let me cover this real quick. There are different terms to describe America when you want to divide it among particular regions. Yeah, Hispanic America, which is everything that is Spanish speaking, because. Hispania was the province, uh, the Roman province, where, where Spain is today. Then you have Latin Americans, which is a term that was first coined in the 19th century by, um, it was by the French. I cannot remember exactly who, but it was the French who coined the term basically describing all countries in America that uh, whose chief language is derived of a uh, of a Latin language, basically uh, Spanish, Portuguese, French, Italian, and Romanian, among other smaller languages. Um, then you have uh, Luso America, uh, which is basically Brazil, because it's, uh, Luso America is from Lusitania, which was the Roman province where Portugal stands today, and and then you have I. Uh, 
Iberian Americans, which is basically both Spain and Portugal. It's a lot of confusion. It's something that in my classes that uh, where I teach, uh, it's something that we have to discuss all the time. Like what, when they use these terms, what do they mean? Why do they call it that way? It's weird. But the point is, uh, it has a it's a direct spark of these um, these wars of independence in the Spanish Empire, uh, especially in uh, ma uh, chiefly in what is uh, modern days uh, Mexico, Venezuela, and Argentina, where where these wars are going to begin, and then they occupy other areas such as Colombia, Ecuador, Peru, Chile, and uh, central uh, areas of what is Central America, Guatemala. Honduras, Nicaragua, etc. But uh, there are um, two, uh, three notable exceptions, uh, which is Cuba, what is modern-day Dominican Republic, and Puerto Rico, which do not gain their independence after the, these wars. But we'll get into those details uh, at a later point, probably in this video or in a separate video on its own, uh, because talking about Cuba and Puerto Rico is is a fascinating topic. But we'll leave it for later. So let us begin uh, to get uh, into what is the Battle of Salamanca and the wider uh, war of Spanish independence from the French Empire. By 1812, Napoleon's French Empire had a quarter of a million troops stationed in Spain, bogged down in a war that seemed to have no end. They faced a bitter struggle against the people of Spain, who'd taken up arms in a guerrilla war, as well as the remnants of Spain's field armies and an Anglo-Portuguese army under Lord Wellington. But French forces in Spain remained formidable and in firm control of the capital, Madrid, and most major cities. So, as I, was, as I mentioned, uh, the original reason why um, Napoleon invaded Spain was because Portugal was not um, was not doing uh, or participating in what is known as the continental system, which is Napoleon's blockade, economic blockade of Britain in European ports. But the thing is that Portugal has been an ally of Britain since the 14th century. It is the longest uh, official alliance between two countries, at least in Europe. So, with Spain, um, with Spain being an ally of France at the time, they invaded Portugal together, and this actually forced the royal family of Portugal to flee to Brazil. They are the only royal family in the hist in all of Europe to actually set up shop, if, to give it a term. To, uh, to establish themselves in one of their overseas colonies, which is amazing when you think about it. For example, here in Puerto Rico, in La Fortaleza, which is the governor's residence, there, there was a room that was actually reserved for whenever the king of Spain visited the island. The irony of this is that the king of Spain the first king of Spain to ever visit Puerto Rico was King Juan Carlos I in the 1970s. <laughs> he, he was the first one to ever visit, and it's already been 80 years since Puerto Rico has been a, a U.S. territory. So it's it's kind of uh, interesting. Uh, and the uh, and for example, the first time that the kings of the United Kingdom visited the United States was during uh, Roose uh, Franklin Roosevelt's administration. And that was in the 1930s and 40s. So, so knowing that in 1807, which is when the war against Portugal begins, that the F Portuguese royal family flees to Brazil is amazing. So um, skipping over uh, the into the invasion, Spain was completely caught off guard uh, during this during this war, and that's why their field armies are spread out into in different areas. Madrid was captured, and uh, and the royal palace was converted into the new palace for the for Joseph, uh, who's Napoleon's brother, who becomes king of Spain. He was originally king of Naples, 
then they gave him they gave that to Marshal Mura, who is one of Napoleon's marshals, and then he uh, Joseph gay, uh, gets the Kingdom of Spain. So we're going to get into a little bit more details uh, about uh, about this, but it, it's uh, it's a real uh, it's a real calamity. It's like it's really rough for the Spanish right now because their field armies are everywhere. Uh, the the people of Spain are putting up a fierce resistance, something that we don't see in any other place in Europe beyond uh, Russia when they invade in that same year in 1812. Uh, and, the, and the Spanish government is now set up in, in Cadiz. Uh, Cadiz is a port city south of Sevilla. Uh, I did not visit Cadiz. I, I visited Sevilla, which Sevilla, I loved it. It was awesome. That I love that city. Um, but Cadiz is where the the, the, the royal courts, los, las Cortes de Cadiz, the courts of Cadiz, is where basically they, they get rep representatives from different uh, from different parts of America, from the different uh, provinces and other territories to gather in in Cadiz and create uh, a government with the king in exile uh, because Carlos IV had resigned in favor of his son, Fernando, uh, Fernando VII. And basically the whole thing was to bring back Fernando back to the throne of Spain. And we're going to get it. Speaking of that detail, we'll get into that. And we're only 40 seconds in. <laughs> and the year began with another great French victory in the south and a calamity for Spain. This video is sponsored by Audible, our favorite place to go for audiobooks. They have an unmatched selection of fiction, comedy, classics, and original content, all of which you can listen to on the go on pretty much any device you can think of. Of course, we spend most of our time in the history section, and one title we would definitely recommend is Sapiens, the acclaimed history of our species by Yuval Noah Harari. It's full of fascinating and often surprising ideas, such as how the ability to gossip gave humans a crucial evolutionary advantage, and why the farming revolution led to a sharp decline in quality of life for most humans. And because it's audible, you can brush up on evolutionary history while cooking, commuting, or doing nothing very much at all. Go to audible.com slash epichistorytv or text epichistorytv to 500, 500 and start listening with an exclusive 30-day free trial, one free audiobook of your choice, and two Audible originals from an ever-changing list. Thanks to Audible for sponsoring this video. Oye, Rafa, por poco pescaditos solo en cada capicú. Tanto así, Rafa, iba a comprar un equipo. Just a regular ad from here. All right, back to the war. Marshal Sushi. I've seen his Marshal series, and it's awesome. Spain and Portugal would become a graveyard, not just for young French conscripts, but for the reputation of some of France's most famous generals. General Junot, Marshal Soult, and Marshal Jourdain had all tasted defeat. Marshal Massena had been recalled in disgrace. Marshal Louis Gabriel Suchet was the exception. French generals in Spain were notorious for their looting. Soult, based in Andalusia, was probably the worst reckoned to have stolen one and a half million francs worth of art from Spanish monasteries and churches. Which, there's still some, some of that that has, ne uh, has ne uh, never been recovered. As governor of Aragon, Marshal Suchet behaved very differently. He enforced strict discipline on his troops, punishing any who tried to steal or extort money from the Spanish, while treating local authorities with respect. He combined this hearts and minds strategy with ruthless military action against the guerrillas that was able to establish firm control of Aragon. In June 18... So, uh, something that I mentioned before, and there's some, uh, it is a place I, I actually want to visit in, in a future trip that I'm planning to go back to Spain probably next year. Um, 
is the city of Zaragoza, which you can see on the right there in the middle. Uh, Zaragoza was actually besieged twice uh, before the year 1812, uh, and the and it was uh, this one. This uh, fact is that I learned from a uh, from a historian friend of mine who does a lot of reenactment here in San Juan, uh, where he brings sometimes he brings like a uh, like a badge. Um, I wouldn't call it like a badge, but basically, it, it basically represents that. Uh, it was given to the people uh, who defeated the the French at the battle of, at the siege of Zaragoza, because it was considered one of the most relentless and ruthless sieges of the entire war. Because the entire basically the whole populace of the city participated in its defense, not just the army that was stationed in Zaragoza, but the people itself, and it led to one of uh, Marshal Lannes to write to Napoleon, sire, this is a horrifying war, uh, when he, when speaking of the siege of Zaragoza, which is the the second siege specifically, which is the one that he led. 1811, after a particularly bloody assault, Suchet took the port of Tarragona, for which Napoleon rewarded him with his marshal's baton. This is something that, because I know that the um, that he's not Spanish, so the the way that he uh, pronounces the regions and cities is a little weird, uh, because the G does a G sound like a like gut or gutter, like that. Not not a not a J or an, uh, actually an H sounding like ho. Huh. It's not tara, uh, Tarajona. It's Tarragona. Um, and the same way when you said with Aragon, it, it's Aragon. Um, I'm not here to correct the, uh, like, I'm not going to be correcting every single thing that he's going to be saying because uh, naturally, like, you can notice that naturally uh, his, uh, his language, his primary language is not Spanish. It's clearly English. Um, but what I do like is the way that like his, his voice itself. I always find his voice so fascinating when it comes to narration. So I give him props for that. The emperor then sent him reinforcements and ordered him to take Valencia. First, he routed a much larger Spanish army that attacked him at Saguntum before he laid siege to Valencia. The city was packed with Spanish troops and refugees, and to avoid starvation, General Blake surrendered Valencia on the 8th of January, 1812. So th uh, this is something that um, when I used to give tours back in in San Juan, uh, that they sometimes you hear like these English uh, English last names to Spanish officers. Like for example, here we have uh, Alejandro O'Reilly and Thomas O'Daly, that they're Irish. Uh, General Joaquin Blake y Hoyes, which is uh, his name, he uh, he's of Irish descent. He was born in Spain, but he is uh, his uh, I think his father. Or his grandfather, one of the two, was Irish that moved uh, to Spain. So it's uh, it's a pretty com uh, common uh, thing to happen. As a matter of fact, uh, there, uh, I don't think they're ever going to mention this, but I will mention it myself. One of the uh, speaking of Tom, uh, Thomas O'Daly, Thomas O'Daly had a son born here in San Juan. His name was Demetrio O'Daly, and Demetrio O'Daly actually participates in the here in this war. And he, uh, he will, uh, after the war, he will eventually become the first and only uh, Puerto Rican field marshal in the Spanish army. Uh, he, and he, um, in part of, due to his participation in this war. The French took 18,000 prisoners, including 23 generals and nearly 500 guns. It was a devastating blow to the Spanish cause. But to reinforce Suchet, Napoleon had stripped troops from other armies in Spain, and then withdrawn 25,000 of the best troops for his imminent invasion of Russia. The result was that French forces in Spain were now severely overstretched, just as Wellington prepared to strike. So Wellington arrives in Portugal 
at basically at the beginning of this of uh, the Peninsula War in 1807, I think is when he arrives. He was under the command of a different general, and they were both accused of of quote unquote helping the French because uh, they had captured a large French army, but then they uh, the his his superior was the one who actually did all this. Wellington himself did not, but it, it's his superior. He has to follow the orders. Uh, where they actually allowed this French army to go back to France. They they even escorted them back to France with their arms and loot that they had taken from the Portuguese. And it was devastating. It was a, it was a devastating blow for, for uh, his, the way that he actually conducted things. But then he retur- uh, returned back to Portugal, but this time as the commanding officer of British forces in the Iberian Peninsula. And um, managed to uh, get the French out of Portugal, and then we're, as we're going to see now, how did he move his army through uh, through Spain to start knocking out French forces, knowing that they're overstretched. <laughs> Speaking of this phrase, we have in service the scum of the earth as common soldiers enlisted for drink. Uh, is there a quote that it, that is uh, um, attributed to Wellington? Uh, I would, re- if you want to know a little bit more about this, I highly recommend that you watch Brandon F's video uh, that is titled just like that. Oh, did Wellington really call his soldiers the scum of the earth? It is a fascinating. I love uh, Brandon's videos. As a matter of fact, sometimes we actually uh, we don't know each other uh, personally. But we uh, we have played uh, Napoleon Total War against each other on a few points. I just don't know. Uh, he probably doesn't know that I, that it's me. But uh, it's a it's uh, it's a really fascinating video. I recommend his video on on the topic. Spanish guerrillas kept Wellington well informed of French movements. And learning that the forces facing him in western Spain had been much weakened, he decided to go on the offensive, to strike a blow before the French could concentrate against him. On the day that Valencia fell, he laid siege to Theodad Rodrigo on the Portuguese-Spanish frontier. That's the city I I want to visit in the future. Eager to take the city before Marshal Marmont could march to its relief, he ordered an assault after just ten days. It succeeded, though Major General Crawford of the Light Division was among 300 killed. Ciudad Rodrigo has two types of uh, fortifications. There's the medieval fortifications uh, that surround the city, the at least the old the old part of the city, and uh, around those are more modern. Um, 18, uh, 18th century fortifications, like you saw in the in the image there. Uh, it's fascinating. I've seen photos of it, and, and that's one of the reasons why I want to go to Ciudad Rodrigo. And it's just right there on the Portuguese front. It's really close. Wellington then marched south to besiege the much more strongly defended city of Badajoz. Franklin talks about this video like uh, about was made Badajoz, on the night like, of really the 6th briefly. of April. The first wave attacking the main breach were slaughtered. But what was supposed to be a diversionary attack on the city's castle with scaling ladders succeeded, and the city soon fell. The storming of Badajoz cost the British 3,700 casualties. In the aftermath, survivors went on the rampage, drinking, looting and raping and killing more than 100 Spanish civilians before British officers finally restored order. Ads are coming up. Wellington had secured the two main routes between Spain and Portugal. Now he sent his most reliable subordinate, General Hill, with a small Anglo-Portuguese force to destroy the bridge over the Tagus at Almaraz. This was a vital link between Marmont's army of Portugal and Soult's army of the south, as the next usable bridge was at Toledo, 
90 miles east. Toledo is a beautiful city. Like, if you want, like, the most medieval city in the modern world, at least in my experience, that was Toledo. Like, it was such, it was so awesome. And I, and I really did it. I did bad with visiting Toledo because since uh, we were thought, oh, well, Toledo's so small, there's probably not much to do in Toledo um, because my friend had, uh, had not visited to uh, Toledo. It, it was the first time for both of us. And, and I loved the city so much. The, the, the architecture, the, 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 the museums, the places that you can visit, everything. Uh, it was that, and we were only there for two nights. Like we arrived the afternoon one day. We, we couldn't do much that day itself. Then we had only one entire day, which we spent the most part of it in the Alcazar, which is now a military museum. And then the following morning, we had to leave early because uh, we had to, uh, that was the day we were going to Sevilla. So we had to go back to Madrid and then from Madrid, go take the train all the way down to Sevilla. So and ne the next time I'm, going, I'm spending much more time in Toledo because it, I missed out on so much. The bridge was well guarded by forts and redoubts but Hill led a swift and daring assault. The French defences were taken by surprise. The bridge itself and all the engineering equipment burned, for the cost of just 177 casualties. Wellington was now ready to begin his advance into Spain. Spanish regular forces and guerrilla bands began operations to tie down as many French troops as possible. While from the Bay of Biscay, Sir Hume Popham's naval raiding force made diversionary attacks on French coastal targets. This is really well coordinated. Like, I love the coordination that Wellington devises. It reminds me a lot of when Grant takes over the uh, all, U um, all Union forces during the Civil War. They basically does a five-prong attack on different areas from the, uh, from the south, uh, from the west and the, uh, and the north all at the same time to keep uh, the Confederate armies uh, pinned down in their positions. It, it reminds me of that. Wellington did really, really well in, in, this, in this front. In four days, Wellington was at Salamanca, as Marmont, outnumbered, withdrew behind the Douro River. But when reinforcements arrived, he crossed the river again. For six days, Marmont tried to march around Wellington's flank, but the British general matched him move for move, their two armies marching in parallel, often within sight of each other. But on the seventh day, Marmont blundered. Second of July. Uh, there's Salamanca right there in the north. So uh, there's a bridge that you can see right there uh, that crosses the river. That is the old, uh, the old Roman bridge right there. That's the old Roman bridge, and that bridge is so cool. Uh, today there's like three or four bridges, uh, including that one that now cross the river because well, cars and stuff. But but the, uh, the Roman bridge is awesome. You can walk. Uh, you can walk on it, and everything is super, super cool. The the University of Salamanca, which is uh, it was right around here. We visited the the university. That's where, uh, where my friend stu uh, studies. She's doing her her masters. Uh, as a matter, of, she's almost done with the masters. If, if her work gets approved at the time of this recording, uh, uh, she gets her uh, her masters now. Uh, before September, uh, and other uh, the cathedrals nearby. This is where we saw that we could see the battlefield from up there. It was just, <clears throat> sorry, it was just so awesome. Uh, let's continue so we can see the the battle itself. Uh, once we finish the the whole battle part, I want to talk about the the effects of the wars 
in America. Wellington's army occupied high ground four miles south of Salamanca. Marmont was not interested in a direct assault. He still sought to outflank Wellington, threaten his line of retreat to Portugal, and force him to fall back. Around 8 a.m., the French won a dash for a hill known as the Greater Arapil, which Marmont made his observation point. And that's what I explained earlier. That's why this battle also is known in Spain as La Batalla de los Arapiles, uh, because that's where the battle actually took place. It did not take place in the city of Salamanca. The reason why uh, the British called it the Battle of Salamanca because that was the nearest city. That uh, that was like the nearest big city. So, uh, but in Spain, it's known as La Batalla de los Arapiles. You search for that, like that Batalla de los Arapiles, and boom, and they will put it right there. The Battle of Salamanca. As, uh, uh, that is also known as. The French army began to swing round behind him. Marmont had convinced himself that Wellington was an overly cautious general who would not risk attack. The hills hid most of Wellington's army from view. And when Marmont saw dust clouds to the west, he assumed it was Wellington's baggage train leaving Salamanca, beginning their retreat. But it was the British 3rd Division and a Portuguese cavalry brigade moving up to strengthen Wellington's flank. Because he wasn't planning a retreat, he was about to attack. A lot of these uh, soldiers of the British Army are, will eventually participate in the War of 1812 in the United States. And another All right, ad. we need an ad from Quillbot that really shows off its strengths. Yeah, we're we need really to say, nice. Quillbot allows you to paraphrase and using artificial It's insane. Around 2 p.m., Marmont ordered the five infantry divisions waiting in the woods behind him to march west to cut off Wellington's imagined retreat. General McCoon's 5th Division, in the lead, stopped to engage what was presumed to be the British rearguard in the village of Los Arapiles. General Tomier's 7th Division continued west past it. Wellington watched as the French left flank became increasingly strung out and knew it was an opportunity too good to miss. He galloped three miles across country to the 3rd Division to give the crucial orders in person. Which is Many impressive. of his staff officers struggled to keep up. Oh. On arrival, he instructed the division's commander, his own brother-in-law, Edward Pakenham, to attack and drive everything before him. Pakenham is going to lead the British Army in the Battle of New Orleans and will die in that third battle. 3rd Division's advance uh, was if you want to know more about the Battle of New Orleans, at least like a like a really uh, bi uh, like a big overview on the battle, Atun uh in, in his in his early videos, he has one of the Battle of New Orleans uh, where he finds it funny because it, it did not take place in New Orleans but in Chalmette. But yeah, it, that's another one. Those videos that I'm, I'm talking about and other things, I will put them in the description, like uh, Atun Sheik and Brandon's video. Uh, they're uh, they're really good. Like I'm. They're really good history videos. I'm, I really appreciate everything that they do. It was hidden by low hills until the last minute. Tommy Ayer's division was caught completely unawares and shattered by the assault. Tommy Ayer's himself was killed. Half his division killed or captured. The rest soon put to flight. At this crucial moment, Marshal Marmont was hit by a British shell and carried from the field seriously wounded. His second in command, General Bonnet, was himself wounded an hour later. So command passed to General Clausel. 45 minutes later, the British 5th Division attacked, supported by two Portuguese brigades and General Le Marchand's dragoons. The French saw the cavalry coming and formed square, but were hit first by the British infantry, who unleashed a close-range volley, then charged with the bayonet. The French were routed and charged down by Le Marchand's cavalry. 
French 6th Division was caught up in the collapse. The Marchand himself after was blunder. shot from the saddle, but his brigade had helped destroy eight French battalions and capture two eagles. Wellington's echelon attack continued, as Cole's 4th Division advanced in the centre. But Pack's Portuguese brigade was thrown back from the Greater Arapil, and the whole division was soon falling back in disorder. Despite the devastation of his army's left flank, General Clausel decided to launch an attack on the Lesser Arapil, the hinge of Wellington's position. If it could be taken, he might still snatch victory from the jaws of defeat. But the French advance was met by fresh troops of Clinton's 6th Division, who poured volleys of musket fire into the French columns. They began to fall back. The French army had lost the will to fight on, its soldiers streaming away into the woods behind them. General Ferre's 3rd Division mounted a brave rearguard action to buy the rest of the army time to escape, but it faced a hopeless task. It was soon outflanked by the British 5th Division, and Ferre himself was killed. Only General Foy's 1st Division escaped in good order. With darkness falling and his army exhausted, Wellington called off the pursuit. So full, it, this was all a one-day battle, by the way. Uh, speaking of the Cortes, it, that photo in the back is uh, is a painting of the of uh, the Cortes of Cadiz. It was uh, it, it was a thing. The, the, the building where they where they gathered is it's now a museum in Cadiz. It's Cadiz is another city. I, there's so many cities in Spain I want to visit, and I just don't have enough time. Wellington had smashed Marmont's army, taking 7,000 prisoners and killing or wounding 6,000 more, a French casualty rate of 25% and more than double Wellington's own losses. The next day, dragoons of the King's German Legion attacked the French rearguard and achieved the almost unheard of feat of charging down a French infantry square and taking another thousand prisoners. Wellington now decided to march on Madrid, forcing King Joseph to abandon the capital and retreat to Valencia to join up with Marshal Suchet. On the 12th of August, Wellington well. liberated the city to scenes of wild celebration. We were in Madrid for four nights, and Madrid is beautiful. We, uh, even though we went in December, that it was cold, it was uh, we still had a really, really awesome time in Madrid. So much stuff. Soult, now at risk of being cut off in Andalusia, abandoned the siege of Cadiz, which had dragged on for two and a half years, mm -hmm. and marched east the longest to join the Joseph I think and Suchet. The longest. The following month, Wellington marched north, pushing the French back from Valladolid and besieging the castle of Burgos. But his army lacked heavy guns, and the French garrison fought bravely. As powerful French armies gathered to the north and south, Wellington, Wellington himself, himself was, was now in danger of being trapped. He had no choice but to withdraw. Wellington's retreat turned into a desperate, forced march through autumn rain. The supply system collapsed, and many starving soldiers looted what food they could find from Spanish villages. Madrid was abandoned and reoccupied by the French on the 1st of November. Wellington was back where he'd started five months before. But, there's a difference. but despite the campaign's dismal conclusion, his strike into Spain had led to the liberation of huge swathes of the country, and left the French more overstretched than ever. They had lost so many soldiers, uh, then they have to start pulling in from other places and just keep overstretching, overstretching. 
which is yeah, it's just amazing. Just to, just by thinking about it, the whole strategy, like oh yeah, we won the battle of Salamanca. It was the battle of Salamanca is important. You think oh, but you fought, you fought this battle, but you couldn't keep the, neither that city nor the capital. But look at the the other results. It forced the Fre uh, the French out of other areas to now defend the northern, the basically the northern half of the country. So now the whole the, the whole southern area, which is the 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 autonomous communities of of Andalusia, Extremadura, uh, and parts of Castilla La Mancha, and uh, Castilla y León, among other areas like Galicia and Asturias, they're liberated. So you now you have more uh, people in Spain that can also boast uh, like boost their armies as well. So. So it, it all worked out at the end. Reinforced and resupplied, Wellington would be back the next year to deliver the final blow to Joseph's Spanish kingdom. So the they have also a video of the Battle of Vitoria, uh, which is in which is in, uh, in País Vasco, that's to the northeast of, of Spain near the French border. Uh, Good video if you want to watch it. Uh, let's see if there's, if there's anything else before I 1812 enter. had seen the tide of war turn, and not just in Spain, because 2,000 miles to the east oh, the in Russia, Russia, the Russian campaign, catastrophe had engulfed the Grand Armée. So uh, basically, that will, that's going to be the end of the video because then they'll go, probably go into credits. But I want to use this map of Europe that they have to explain because the situation in America. Okay, let's leave it right there. Okay, so what is going on in America when all this is happening in Europe? Okay. So in 1808 with the with the invasion with the French invasion of Spain, the the four viceroys of of America, the four Spanish viceroys of America are in a in a predicament. They're like what is going on? What do we do? Because do we join uh, and claim our loyalty to Joseph, to Joseph Bonaparte, or do we fight and stay loyal to Fernando VII, for, uh, for, uh, Fernando the Seventh? And th and this is where the things get. They uh, they don't actually entirely make a decision, but the people in the Americas, they t make they make them decide in a in a sense. So let's start with the first one. Let's start with Mexico. They were the first ones to to react. Mexico is not Mexico yet. This is the um, the vice royalty of New Spain, which covers a lot of territory. Basically, all the territory from California down to Panama and including the Caribbean and Florida is all uh, New Spain. So Miguel Hidalgo, which is uh, he was a priest uh, in the town of Do uh, Dolores, which is in the, uh, which is north of Mexico City. Um, he basically does like a, he, he he does what is known as a, el, el grito de Dolores, the cry of Dolores, and basically he he is advocating for the return of King. Uh, Fernando VII. He claims it that way. Que viva Fernando VII. He, uh, he, uh, and because he feared that the vice royalty of New Spain was going to favor Joseph due to the new situation. And leads uh, a ba uh, what you can call an army is uh, because it wasn't really all that well organized. Uh, leads them to different cities. Uh, claiming that uh, these people are traitors, they they want to give they want to give our territory to France and all that, and that's what sparks, according to modern day historiography, the uh, War of Independence of Mexico. When in reality, all he was doing was <laughs> trying to uh, claim that uh, uh, King Ferdinand is the rightful king of Spain, not Joseph. And yet he is known as the father of Mexican independence. I consider that not the case. The real father of Mexican independence is Agustin de Iturbide. 
when between 1820 and 1821, he actually managed to get uh, get Mexican independence. So there's that. In Venezuela, you have Simón Bolívar. The in the case of Venezuela and Argentina, Argentina was under José de San Martín. Um, the, this is a very interesting situation because they're not fighting for one side or these are actual wars of independence because this is led by a Creole class in South America. Basically, what the problem was that after the War of Spanish Secession, which happened between 1701 and 1714, the Bourbon, uh, the Bourbon uh, kings of France, uh, the Bourbon family, the dynasty, takes over Spain because the, uh, Philippe de Anjou was the rifle, uh, was uh, one of the two uh, rifle cl uh, claims to the throne of Spain after the death of Carlos II, who had no children when he died. The other is Arch was the Archduke of Austria uh, for the Habsburgs. And at the end, the, the Bourbons won, mostly because the, the, the Emperor of Austria died, so causing his son to secede him, meaning that you cannot be the king of two countries at the same time. So France, you win. Um, so then they do a series of reforms known as the Bourbon reforms, uh, Las Reformas Borbonicas. And basically what happened was that the Creole class in, the, in Spanish America, uh, they, were, uh, they got their rights diminished, not taken, diminished in favor of peninsular uh, officers and other heads of state. So with, with, that, uh, with, the, uh, with them basically grumbling about that for the next 100 years, uh, it, it, they would take their chance now that Spain is dealing with their own thing. So let them do, uh, let them deal with that and let's take this chance and fight and, and get our rights back. They're not, uh, not like in the American Revolution where the Olive Branch petition basically said, oh, our rights are being trampled on by Parliament. Oh, King George, help us uh, uh, get our rights back, et cetera, et cetera. Basically just condensing that into a few seconds. It, they did not do that in in Spanish America because they had, they had no one to do it to. King Ferdinand is arrested. The, the, they don't consider the, the, the courts of Cadiz as, uh, as a legitimate government, despite the fact that they were the government uh, of, of Spain, it, it, at least uh, on paper. So, so uh, people like Simón Bolívar took uh, this chance and uh, basically ended up creating... Their, uh, their own countries, in the case of Bolivia, he will create what's known as La Gran Colombia, which is, consists today of Venezuela, Colombia, and Ecuador, with parts of Peru. Um, all because, it, so they could get their rights back, because you can say that the, revo the uh, what they call the Latin American Revolution, they're not actually revolutions. They're just, basically, uh, they just change who's in charge. Everything remained the, almost the same for, uh, in some parts, not for everything. Uh, it's that I'll leave that. That's a story for another time because uh, Bolivar is a very controversial figure. At least, in, well, at, in Venezuela, in those countries, he's not because he's held as a liberator. But in other places that were not affected by him, like for example, in the Caribbean and in in Spain, not so much. There was, he did a lot of very really uh, controversial things after uh, the independence of these countries. Like, for example, uh, they forced independence on Peru. Peru did not rise up in arms against Spain. They were the only ones who didn't, other than the Caribbean islands. They were forced the, uh, their independence uh, by both Bolivar and San Martin. And uh, a lot of Indians lost their rights that they had under the Spanish Empire. They lost them under uh, these new independent countries and slavery was not abolished immediately. It was, it would, it won't be deck until decades later than they, they will abolish slavery. A lot of the treasury that was there, um, 
was either lost or, or stuff like that. When people ask, oh, what, the, that Spain took all the gold? Not really. It, there's a, there was a concept known as La Quinta Real, which basically 80% of all, uh, of all uh, okay, 20%. Of all uh, goods produced in America will go straight back to Spain. The other 80% will stay because you have to – how are you going to fund the local governments? How are you going to build roads, hospitals, fortifications, maintain an army, maintain a government if you don't have money? Why send it back over there and to then bring it back again? That makes no sense. So they, ke uh, they kept 80% of the money and a lot of that has disappeared uh, after the independence. Uh, there's some people that from articles that I've read – uh, that the British had taken it because the British had actually assisted in part uh, these uh, wars, uh, wars of independence. Others were just uh, divided among the winners and all that kind of stuff. But that, I'll leave that. Uh, I don't want to <laughs> make make this video too controversial. Uh, we'll, we can talk about that in another time when I uh, gather a bit of more information to make the video, like, uh, make it right. Uh, about how uh, how it is so to see how, to see basically see both sides of the story. What are the the, uh, the independence movements talking about? What are the royalists talking about and all that? But uh, basically, that will be uh, that will be all for today. Uh, this was a very long reaction video, uh, but. Yeah, it, uh, we saw the Battle of Salamanca, how, uh, the effects of the Peninsular War in America, and all that. We'll talk about more of these subjects later. Um, so. I want to end this video on on a on a high note, and uh, at at the end, for now, I, I want to show some photos of my trip to Salamanca, uh, and and hope that other people can also visit. Uh, Salamanca is a beautiful city. It's very uh, it's very quiet. It's a university city. The University of Salamanca is the oldest university of Spain. It's over eight hundred years old. Um, it's and it's really beautiful, and. So yeah, so uh, thank uh, thank you all for for joining, and as always, I will see you all in paradise.